But we really have an issue as to how we should define it, because we have got, as we'll see, a slew of laboratory methods available to us that work by different principles, and it's really not clear how the aspirin resistance should even be defined. Should it, in fact, be defined by laboratory tests at all? Is it better defined as clinical failure of aspirin therapy? Or should it be defined as a, uh, the inability of aspirin to specifically inhibit platelet uh, function you by the aspirin-sensitive pathway? Or, since there is a method out for this, uh, should, it, should it or could it be defined uh, by uh, a normal urinary concentration of thromboxane metabolites, such as uh, uh, thromboxane B2 accumulation in the urine, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll leave the, the, the clinical failure uh, aside and now concentrate on, on what the laboratory uh, potential is for, for assessing and uh, measuring aspirin resistance. And we really can go two different ways with this. We can either go the, the platelet function route, which is looking at the ability of aspirin to specifically affect that arachidonic acid dependent pathway in platelets, or we can look at urinary thromboxane A2. Within platelet function, we've got the PFA100 we talked about, we've got plate aggregation methods, whether they be optical or impedance, we've got the Verify Now aggregation system, and we've got thromboelastography. Well, some years ago, um, we just, we were playing with the PFA, and we were actually looking at the uh, the effects of aspirin in some normal volunteers. And in the, in the left-hand panel of this slide, you can see some, some data from four people in my laboratory who were given 600 milligrams of aspirin, and then two hours later, we repeated their PFA 100. And you can see that three out of four of those uh, individuals reacted like we expected them to, that the aspirin inhibited their closure time, uh, greatly prolonged the closure time, and the PFA went to 300 plus seconds. But surprisingly at the time, uh, because the whole aspirin resistance thing was not particularly well talked about back then, um, we noticed that one of our uh, staff members did not react that way, that she almost had no increase in PFA 100 closure time with aspirin. But what was interesting is because we went on and we did arachidonic acid-induced whole blood aggregation on these four individuals, and they all reacted as expected. They all had a, a complete flattening of their arachidonic acid-induced aggregation. So this was really our first indication that aspirin resistance by one method is not necessarily mirrored by another. In this case, the PFA says this patient or this normal person ostensibly is aspirin resistant, whereas the aggregation said no, she reacted in just the same way you'd expect. And this discordance really has, has been borne out in clinical studies. Here's one study looking at over 300 patients with, sta with, with stable um, coronary artery disease. And depending on whether you classify them as resistant on a combination of agonists in the, PF, in the aggregation methodology with ADP and arachidonic acid, in which case if you uh, respond to what, one but not both of those, resistance is about 24%. If you don't respond to either of them, then it's classified at about 6%, whereas the PFA weighs in at about 10%. So, and there's actually very poor concordance between these two approaches to measuring aspirin resistance. So they're not apparently measuring the same thing. Now, there seems to be little question that if, for example, if we take the PFA as shown in this slide, that the results of the PFA, if we call if we define aspirin resistance as a normal closure time, even in the face of aspirin therapy, and that's how we define aspirin resistance, that there is a correlation between that finding and clinical outcome. So for example, this is a stroke study. It's a small study, but it's interesting because these are stroke patients followed up for two years. And in the patients that were asymptomatic for those two years, had no further events, the PFA 100 was prolonged as expected by the aspirin therapy in everybody. But if you look at the other group that were symptomatic, they, they had a stroke or a transient ischemic attack sometime in that two-year follow-up period. Overall, the PFA 100 closure times were significantly shorter in that group and were actually normal in about one-third of patients. So we'll, we'll come on to whether or not we're, de we're detecting aspirin resistant or some surrogate marker, but it doesn't really matter. From the test standpoint, it is somewhat predictive of adverse outcome. But with the PFA, at least, the question really arises, are we really looking at aspirin resistance as judged by the failure of aspirin to inhibit the arachidonic acid pathway? Or are we looking at some other phenomenon? And it seems to be with the PFA that at least part of the story is that a lot of these patients have elevated levels of von Willebrand factor. 
And because of the great dependence of von Willebrand factor, uh, or the closure time, should I say, on von Willebrand factor, it seems that even though you can have a platelet defect, if you elevate the von Willebrand factor levels high enough, you can shorten the PFA back to normal or near normal values and therefore give you the illusion in this, in this uh, scenario of aspirin resistance. For, so for example, you can take a patient, and we've done this, with, with hermansky pudlak syndrome, lifelong bleeding disorder, inability to release their granules and give them DDAVP, which elevates their von Willebrand factor levels and their bleeding time and PFA comes back to normal and they've stopped bleeding. So it's, it's it's not really fixing their platelet defect, but it is fixing their bleeding. And, and, and I think the same kind of thing goes on, goes on here too. Uh, so that was one study. Then another study really uh, looked at patients and classified them as, as to whether their response to aspirin was good or poor and looked at the levels of von Willebrand factor. And again, you see significantly higher levels of von Willebrand factor in those patients that are classified as poor responders compared to those that are classified as uh, good responders to aspirin therapy. Now, if you look at platelet irrigation as your, as your method for detecting aspirin resistance, again, you see correlation with clinical outcome. Um, here's a study, which is actually the same study that you saw earlier, just some different data attached to it. And you can see that if the about 5% of patients are classified as aspirin resistant when they, are, they, they show normal aggregation to those two agonists. And those patients had about a threefold increased risk of recurrent myocardial infarction or major adverse cardiac events. Now, the Verify Now aspirin assay, I showed you the, the, the broad principle in a previous slide. Now what I'm showing you is the specific principle for the, their aspirin assay. And basically, the, the platelets are activated with arachidonic acid, again, causing the exposure of, of glycoprotein 2B3A in activated form. And those can then cross-link those fibrinogen-coated beads and give you an aggregation. And then the aspirin works test for aspirin resistance is, is, is somewhat different. The principle of this assay is that platelets uh, are a significant source of uh, thromboxane A2 this powerful aggregating agent that I alluded to earlier on. Well, thromboxane A2 is extremely unstable and metabolizes spontaneously to a stable metabolite, thromboxane B2. And thromboxane B2 appears and can accumulate uh, in, the, in the urine. And so the, the idea is that in a patient that's on successful aspirin therapy, their ability to make thromboxane A2 and by inference thromboxane B2 will be diminished. And so levels of thromboxane B2, or more specifically 11-dehydrothromboxane B2, uh, in the urine will be decreased. And so this is an ELISA assay to measure specifically uh, the levels of, uh, of TXB2 in the urine. And so normal levels or near normal levels of thromboxane B2 in the urine is taken to be uh, indicative of aspirin resistance. And once again, if you look at the data, and these data were published a few years ago now in circulation, there seems to be a, a, a clear relationship between the levels of thromboxane B2 in the urine and the risk of recurrent cardiovascular events. And again, it's, it's quite consistent in the literature with all these different tests that aspirin resistance defined by any of these tests seems to confer about a three to four fold increased risk of major cardiovascular events and, and in this particular assay is somewhat related to the levels of uh, thromboxane B2 in the urine. 